Yo, happy Tuesday to everybody. Happy Tuesday. Wait for some people to log on. Good morning, good morning. Or good afternoon. Actually, the first one to say good afternoon to y'all. Um, well, let me tell you guys something. I am burning much midnight oil um, as I'm getting this book rewritten and edited and then over to my editors as they are editing it and then they get it back to me. Um, yeah, just thank you for your prayers. I could definitely feel them. Um, I got my grad school paper in, got an A on the paper. Um, and now of course, just doing the editing with the book. And it actually, you know, this is actually the um, first edition. Um, so this book actually is going to be, it's not just being republished um, through Calvary Publishing, um, you know, everywhere, but, um, it actually is going to be an updated edition. So a second edition, just if you care to know, second edition applies to textbooks. Um, when you do a second edition of a non textbook, non academic book, it's called an updated edition. So I'm actually rewriting a lot of it. Um, just, it just, I don't know, God's just blessing and there's just more content going in, especially um, in highlighting themes of classism, racism, um, just um, the different isms and worldviews um, and just all the more just so it channels into Christ culture, subculture uh, and the evolution of hip hop, you know. Um, so anyway, thank you for your prayers. Um, yo, I have not been able to do the study on pilot that I wanted to do. Um, here is the book. Um, I'm using Exploring People of the New Testament. Um, I think Phillips does the best character studies. He actually has four volumes. Um, he has Exploring People of the Old Testament. It's three volumes by Phillips. Um, but he has Exploring People of the New Testament, which is one volume. He does the best character studies Um he really paints a picture and doesn't just fill in good information, but he makes the person knowable. I mean, like when you're done doing his character studies, you feel like you know the person. Now, you know, I don't mind sharing my sources. Um, I know some pastors keep everything close to the chest. Look, if you're really, you know, just wanting God to get all the glory and you really want to teach others how to teach the word and you're really confident uh, that you hear from God, you don't mind sharing your, your sources. I'll share everything with y'all. Um, here is a book that you will find. This is called Bible Characters. This is by Alexander White, W-H-Y-T-E. If you're curious about this guy, Alexander White, um, I actually have some Alexander White somewhere around here, but Alexander White actually had a tremendous influence on Warren Wearsby. Um, so, uh, anyway, if you just want to check him out as well. So this is what I thought we'd do today. Um, like I said, we're really on this theme of community. Last night, the Zoom group was great. Um, I would really encourage people, you know, I couldn't be on the Zoom group because I'm just working on this deadline with the book. Um, you know, and the goal is to have everything done by Friday. Um, the goal is to have everything with the book done by Friday. So I really need your guys' prayers as I'm just plowing through this week. Um, uh, pulling a lot of all-nighters. Um, I got that all-nighter face going on, but yo, man, right? It's go time. It's go time. Um, one thing I would encourage you guys with the Zoom groups is, yo, if you're on that Zoom group, let your face be seen because I know you guys don't want to see me do daily bread drive through and the whole time, you know, everybody puts up different screens while they're talking. I know y'all don't want me to do daily bread drive through and the whole time, this is all you're saying. You know, it's just like, you know, it's all other faces. Look, you know, we are, we, look, I know corporate America might allow it, but I don't care what corporate America allows. If it's about us seeing one another, yo, enter into our world, you know, come see what's going on. See the all nighter face. We got to really let that level of vulnerability go up. You know, um, my wife will even share that her and her coworkers have gotten closer because they are all entering into each other's worlds, dogs barking, you know, good days, bad days, you know, uh, what each other's bedrooms look like, because a lot of her and her other attorney colleagues uh, may have the office in the bedroom or a desk in the bedroom or whatever, you know, so, you know, let's, let's embrace that. Let's, let's be vulnerable. So look, enough sharing. Um, Let's look at Isaiah 53 today. I just thought, hey, what would just be something good to get into? Because, 
we know we need to know how to get in the word where we have prepared um, and where we're just turning to be blessed. Right. Uh, of course, uh, a pastor is encouraged to be instant in season and out of season. Do you know about Isaiah 53? Do you know about Isaiah 53? Two chapters you've got to know about in the Old Testament are Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. They are called the Messianic chapters of the Old Testament. Why are they called the Messianic chapters of the Old Testament? They're called that because they, hundreds of years, hundreds of years before the advent of our Lord, before God Almighty, before the Creator uh, came down as a creature, before the infinite came down as an infant, hundreds of years before the first advent of the Messiah, the Holy Spirit anointed two men to write out such amazing detail um, about the Messiah that it's supernatural. There's no way they could have known this much insider information, all of the details about the Messiah. So one of them is the prophet Isaiah, as you see here in Isaiah 53. The other one is King David, uh, who wrote Psalm 22. So Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 are the two messianic chapters of the Old Testament. Let's go to um, Isaiah 53. And actually, it really, as you know, this was written in, with no chapter breaks. Let's begin at Isaiah 52, verse 13. All of you need to know Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 is where God says, I am God and there is none other. I am God and there's none like me. And then he shares how God alone does something with his book, the Bible, that all 27 other books, divine books on the planet that claim divine origin. So I'll say divine books, something that none of them have the audacity to do because God only wrote one book. Only the Bible is supernatural. Only the Bible is God's word. And God lets you know how you can see that the Bible alone is God's word. He says in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. And then he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times telling things that are not yet done. What is he saying? The way you could tell the Bible is God's supernatural revelation to mankind. The way you could tell that the Bible is the only revelation of God to man out of some 27 other books on the planet that claim divine origin. The Bible is the only book with the audacity to tell you history before it happens. And then God even offers the challenge in Isaiah 41, Isaiah 41 verses 21 through 24. He says to all the other so-called gods, you come forward, tell us, verse 23, things that are to come hereafter so we can know that you are gods. He says, tell us the future. Tell us things before they happen. Prove that you are God and sit outside of the linear timeline by telling us what's to come next on the linear timeline before us finite creatures experience it on the linear timeline. God alone does that. The Bible alone does that. Do you know this kind of stuff? Because I don't know about you, but I'm surrounded by seekers and skeptics. I'm surrounded by those who've not yet come to a saving knowledge of Christ. You've got to be able to share Jesus, to share the gospel, but oftentimes before even getting to that point, you've got to show people that this is God's revelation to mankind. Bible prophecy is what got me ready to hear the gospel, right? Now, sometimes just preaching the gospel, just, gosh, the Holy Spirit is moving so mightily. You just proclaim Christ. The person has no problem believing that the Bible is God's word. The person's never looked at any other false religions. The person even believes, you know, that the Bible has an answer for them. You could just go right in with the historicity of the Christ and with the gospel. But for others, right, um, you're going to need to first lay a foundation that this is God's word, not the Quran, not the Upanishads. This alone is God's word. It is not a way. It is the way. Why? Not because we say so, but because God God says so, right? So one thing when I'm sharing Christ with someone is I'm careful to use the right wording so it's obvious who's doing the heavy lifting. Well, Jesus is God. Then another person could say, well, you say he's God. Yes, I do say he's God. Well, I don't agree with what you say. Well, I'm saying he's God. Well, no, no, wait a minute. You're trying to do the heavy lifting there. 
Let Jesus do the heavy lifting. Let God do the heavy lifting. Jesus said he is God. Now that's a whole different statement. John chapter eight, he says, before Abraham was, I am, saying that that was him at the burning bush, that he is Jehovah, the Lord who makes covenant with his people and who reveals himself to his people, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, all judgment is given unto me. Jesus turned water into wine, multiplied the loaves and the fishes, showing he is the Elohim. I love making clear, Jesus said he's God. When I'm talking with the Muslim, when I'm talking with, you know, uh, maybe of those of the Hindu worldview that just see Jesus as an ascended master, I don't just come in and say, well, us Christians say this, or the church says this. No, Jesus said that he is God. Jesus said that. So, let the Bible do the talking. The Bible says that it is God's word and there's none else. God says, right? Not just, well, the church says it, not just that me as a Christian say it. God says it. And what are you going to do with what God said? Boom. Let's get into Isaiah 53. First, Isaiah 52, verse 13. It says, behold, my servant, the first time we see the Messiah introduced to us through the prophet Isaiah, he's referred to as a servant, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus said, the son of man has come not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. So behold, my servant, Isaiah 52, verse 13. And listen, you've got to know this. By the way, if you're going to share Jesus with a Jewish person, you have to be able to show Christ in the Old Testament, period. You've got to. Do you know how to do that? Come on, you guys. We've got to get our weight up. We've got to get our weight up. This is an exciting thing. We've got to grow. If you've been on Daily Bread drive through uh, and been journeying with us, you should be flexy with the scriptures at this point. You should be able to turn and do this and do that. But look, go back and look at your notes. I'm assuming you're taking notes. So verse 13 of Isaiah 52, behold, my servant will deal prudently. He will be exalted and be extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage, look at this, Isaiah 52, verse 14, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. That is the prophecy speaking of how Christ would not only be crucified, but he, he would be beaten beyond human recognition. His visage, his appearance, look at what it says, was more marred than any man. Look at that. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. As you know, on the day of atonement, right? The only day where the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people, he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice upon the mercy seat so that it would not have to be a seat of judgment, that it could be a seat of mercy. This is saying that Christ's blood is the true blood that brings atonement. That's why the word here in Isaiah 52, 15 is sprinkle. So will he sprinkle many nations nations. Just think of the preciousness of the blood of Jesus, that our Lord can come down and put on one human frame, and that in hanging on that cross, as the Roman soldier ran the spear through his side and out of which came water and blood, that that blood can sprinkle and sprinkles many nations where all and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Isaiah 52 verse 15, so will he sprinkle many nations Kings were shut, will shut their mouths at him. You think of Herod, you know, where they just stood before him and by his character, by what he said when Jesus was being tried and by what Jesus didn't say when he would just stand silently, right? It says kings will shut their mouths at him for that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Yo, they only heard the half about this uh, miracle worker walking through the country of Israel. And when they finally brought Jesus or had Jesus brought before them, they were just blown away by what they saw. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I love it's asking this question. Who's believed our report? Who has believed God Almighty came down born of a virgin. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, that this would be the sign. A virgin will bring 
forth a child and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? Who's believed our report? Who has believed our report? That our Lord came down in this fashion and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, if you believe in this account, if you believe in the historicity of Christ, if you believe that he is the fulfillment of all of Old Testament scripture, you are believing in God's report and the arm of the Lord has been revealed to you. The arm in scripture always represents strength. Who has seen the strength of God? Who has seen the strength of God in embracing the gospel truth and having their life transformed? Who has believed our report? There's many reports going on. Jesus said to the disciples when they stood at Caesarea Philippi, who do people say that I am? They said, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some say, you know, that you are that prophet. He says, but who do you say that I am? There's many reports going on about Jesus, but who has believed this report, the report of scripture? Who has believed our report? Yo, we could just stay on Isaiah 53 verse one and keep it popping. Let's go. Yo, by the way, Man, this community is so awesome. You see how like I came on just feeling all like, oh uh, man, all nighter, all nighter. Let me take a break from working, do this and go back to work. Now I don't want to go nowhere. So let's keep it moving. Verse two, for he will grow up before him as a tender plant. This is speaking of the humanity of the Messiah, the humanity of God Almighty, the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, fully all the time, all God, all man, all the time, right? First Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So he will grow up before him. He will grow up before Jehovah. The Messiah will grow up before the father. Look at this as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. A root coming out of dry ground is the opposite of something coming out of fertile, rich soil. This is actually speaking of the humble upbringing of the Messiah, even the poverty of the Messiah. And you know that our Lord was born in a form of poverty because in Luke chapter two, when Mary brings the offering for purification after the birth of Jesus, she presents two turtle doves, which was the lowest form. That was the poor person's offering who could not bring the larger livestock. So he he, look at this, it's prophesying hundreds of years beforehand that he would grow up as a root out of dry ground. Here's the thing, and that's how you realize it says in the word that if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are blinded and who Satan, the God of this world, has blinded their minds. Um, and basically that is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. If someone doesn't believe this, it's because it's saying their minds are blinded. It's not saying because it doesn't make sense. It's not saying because it's just too cranial and too deep like Einstein's theory of relativity. It is so clear how people can invent the microwave oven and people can, you know, all of these different things, but just can't put together all of these prophecies as verified by the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls that they actually were written before the Messiah came and that all of them point to Jesus, not to mention that Jesus is the most popular and most amazing, undeniably amazing person to ever walk the earth. Even an atheist has to confess that. So when people don't believe this, it's because 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the devil has blinded their minds. That's why when you're praying for someone to be enlightened, it really shows you the effects of sin and the effects of everyone being in a spiritual war. The enemy blinds people's minds that they just can't get it. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters and our friends who are still, you know, not yet in the faith, right? And have not yet come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Um, it is a spiritual blindness where it is actually the enemy who sticks to, seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, deceiving and blinding. So again, for those of you who've just come on, we're looking at Isaiah 53, which is one of the most powerful messianic chapters in the Old Testament. If, let's just keep it moving. It's amazing to see the detail. So one, we already see it prophesied that the Messiah would come as a servant, Isaiah 52, verse 13. 
right? We already see it prophesied hundreds of years beforehand that the Messiah would come down, verse 14, and that he would be beaten beyond human recognition, Isaiah 52, verse 14. Isaiah 52, verse 15, we see it prophesied hundreds of years before the Messiah came that his blood would sprinkle and provide atonement. Though he would be beaten beyond human recognition, it would be for the shedding of that blood that would sprinkle and provide atonement for many nations. We see in Isaiah 52, verse 15, that King Kings would stand astonished before this Messiah, and we see that fulfilled when Christ was being tried by Pilate and by Herod. Then Isaiah 53 verse 2 says he will grow up before Jehovah as a tender plant, speaking of the true humanity of the Messiah, and as a root of dry ground, speaking of the poverty um, of the Messiah. Here's what's deep too. You notice that it doesn't tell you um, what skin color Jesus was. You notice it doesn't tell you um, what he would look like. You know, there's no description of Jesus, what the length of his hair, what kind of, how he, I don't know. You don't see that, right? Now, obviously, Jesus was a Middle Eastern man. If you go out to the Middle East today, you see olive complected people to where if you go and visit Israel, and I've been there twice, it's hard to distinguish between an Israeli and a Palestinian oftentimes. Um, sometimes it only comes down to listen to them speak, whether you're hearing Hebrew or Arabic. Jesus no doubt looked like that, right? So it says that he would come up as a root out of dry ground. <clears throat> and it does say, say this, look at this, Isaiah 53, verse two, he has no form nor comeliness. It's interesting that there's no description of Jesus, right? And God does that on purpose. Even when Jesus gives us his biography, right? In Matthew chapter 11, he said, he gives us the shortest autobiography that someone ever wrote. He says, come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, a six word autobiography. Boom, that's all he chose to do. So though we don't see a description of what Jesus looked like, what we do see in Isaiah 53 verse two is that basically look at this. He has no form nor comeliness. There's no beauty or handsomeness about him and when we will see him there's no beauty that we should desire him what it does tell you is that jesus had there was nothing striking god chose he could have come down any way he wanted he could have come down as the ultimate in gq he could have come down as the ultimate in swag he could have come down in the ultimate of the model face and all of that you know uh fanfare stuff he chose to come down in a way that it says in isaiah 53 verse 2 that when you saw him there was nothing about him that would make you do a double take he just he chose to come down and look what's called average look it says there's he has no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there's no beauty that we should desire him this is prophesied hundreds of years before christ came let's keep it moving verse three he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Wow, a man of sorrows. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Here's what's interesting. If you show Isaiah 53 to a Jewish person, what rabbis, many and most rabbis teach people is that Isaiah 53 is a summary of the sufferings of the people of Israel. And when you read about, you know, them being a root out of dry ground and read about them being a man of sorrows that is speaking of what Israel went through. Problem. Here's the problem. One, <clears throat> it's clearly referring to one person, right? Two, Israel is always personified in the feminine gender. Israel is always personified as a she, as the wife of Jehovah. This is in the masculine. Let's keep it moving, all right? So it says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And it's basically saying that he came among us and we rejected him. He came among us. Like Martin Luther said, people want to get in the debate of who crucified Jesus. Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? We all crucified Jesus. Martin Luther said, we all carry his nails in our back pocket. We turned our backs on him. 
if you were there, you would have done the same thing. We, we are the same fickle people who would have been yelling Hosanna, Hosanna when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and then swayed with the crowd, which I watch Christians do just like no, everybody else, just sway with the crowd and then the next day be saying, crucify him, crucify him, or rather, you know, days later, you know, in Holy Week. So it says that he came down acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows. We esteemed him not. Um, basically, basically saying we did not appreciate his worth or esteem him. When Christ came down, the majority did not appreciate his worth or esteem him. Again, this is prophesied hundreds of years before Christ came. Surely, verse four, he was, it says in verse three, he was acquainted with griefs because why? Verse four, he was carrying our griefs and griefs means our sicknesses, our weaknesses, our distresses. He came down as a burdened man. The God man came down and walked as a burdened man because he was carrying our burdens, the depressing thoughts that burden us, our sickness, our weakness. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet he never sinned, Hebrews 4. He went through every experience and every emotional turbulence like what we go through. He just never sinned, right? So surely, never mind them dogs, he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know, as he was taking on all of the suffering of a sin-sick world, what did the sin-sick world do? Looked at him like he got himself in trouble. Looked at him like he got himself crucified. Looked at him like he was just making life more difficult for himself, basically rejecting him. It says in John chapter 1, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, right? But I love this. But verse five, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. What does that mean? For us to have peace with God, for woe begone sinners to have peace with a thrice holy eternal God, for us to have peace, there had to be punishment. And chastisement, which means punishment, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The punishment, the justice meted out for us to have peace with God was put upon Jesus. Look at this. In the, the gospel is being poured out in Isaiah 53, hundreds of years before Christ came and fulfilled it. So it says, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And look at this. And with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. Now, what some have shared is that stripes here actually is not in the plural. It's actually in the singular. And this is referring to when Jesus was scourged. Scourging is when it was designed to get a confession out of a person. Remember, before Jesus was crucified, first he was scourged. Scourging was when you were stripped down to the waist. You were bent over a, a large stone little pillar to hold on to, and they would take a long uh, whip of some nine lashes. In those lashes were embedded bits of sharpened bone, metal, glass, and it was long lashes, and they would whip it around your body and kind of like lawnmower string. It would wrap around your torso. Then the Roman soldier would put his dirty sandal on your side and then yank it off, and it would shred completely going off. It was designed to get a confession out of a person. Remember, Jesus would not open his mouth and speak. It says that Jesus, and we're going to get to that in a minute, he was silent the way a sheep is silent at the slaughter. Because see, if he confessed, he would have had to confess my name. He would have had to confess your name. He would have had to confess who really belonged there, who really deserved the punishment being meted out to him. So it says here that the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Interestingly, the stripes, the gashes, right, from the scourging, it says that those, when he was opened up, when he was ripped open, that provided the healing for us. When he was humiliated and undressed, it was so that we could be healed and properly put back together. So he was taken apart and his being taken apart meant us being put back together right? By his stripes, we are healed. As he's being taken apart, his flesh being ripped, opened, it is so we could have our open wounds closed. Hallelujah, right? 
So it says, with his stripes we are healed. But here's the thing. Some say that the Hebrew is actually saying, with his stripe we are healed. You see, if I have a gash here and a gash here and there's skin in the middle, then that's one stripe, two stripes, plural. But look, if it's saying here, by his stripe we are healed, what that's saying is, there's no skin. If there's no skin in the middle, that is now one giant stripe. It's saying that when he was scourged, he was one open, ripped open wound with not a piece of skin in the middle. See, a piece of skin would make stripes. No skin would make one giant stripe. He was ripped open so that we could be put back together. Hallelujah. Are you claiming that today? Are you claiming today whatever you're burdened with, whatever is grieving you, whatever is weighing you down, whatever sickness, weakness, distress, are you standing on the fact that look at what it says here in the word? Verse four, he came and carried our griefs. That's why it says, in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. He came and carried it. Are you giving it to him today? Okay, you're sighing about it. You're complaining about it. You're talking to other Christians about it. You know, but are you casting it on him? God, this is too big for me. You are the promised Messiah where the prophet Isaiah said that you came and carried my griefs. You command me now in 1 Peter 5, 7 to cast all my cares, my anxieties, my worries, my illnesses, everything upon you because you care for me. Are we doing that? And are we standing on that by his stripes we are healed? What healing do you need? emotional healing, psychological healing. What healing do you need? I recommend you spend some good time just sitting upon these verses, brood upon these verses until you believe them. Yo, man, 1230. You, you want to keep it popping? Let's keep it popping. Okay. All we, verse six, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. It says in Proverbs, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Every one of us has done what's right in our own eyes. All of us have lived relativistic lives, that our truth is our truth, and your truth can be your truth, but it doesn't mean that it's my truth, and my truth is my own truth. The Bible calls that sheep going astray and doing going according to your own way. Someone has to be punished for that. And what does it say here? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The crookedness of us all got laid upon him. He was oppressed, verse 7. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. That was fulfilled when Pilate and when Herod would marvel and say, aren't you going to answer me? When the high priest said, aren't you going to say something? He was fulfilling that scripture right there. Yo, listen, this is amazing. He was taken from prison, verse 8, and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? Like, yo, who's declaring this to the world? Who is declaring what our Lord did? For he was cut off from the land of the living, right? That means an untimely death. Remember Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, speaks of the 70-week prophecy and says that the coming Messiah would be cut off. It means quickly cut off in an untimely and in the prime of one's life. It says here, he is cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. How can a Jewish person read this and try to say that it's talking about the Jewish nation? If you go in any synagogue and say, excuse me, Mr. Rabbi, would you please explain to me Isaiah 53? They're going to say, they, if they say Isaiah 53 speaks of prophecies of the coming Messiah, then they know that you'll say to them, well, don't you know Jesus fulfilled this to the T and I could show you the New Testament verses and show you the historical accuracy? They know that you'd say that, right? So what have they been taught to say? And of course, Jewish rabbis need prayer. Some may know what they're hiding. The majority are just taking stuff in without checking it. You know, how can anyone say that this is referring to the struggles of the suffering Jewish people? Again, the Jewish people are always referred to in the feminine gender in the Old Testament. It's always she, the wife of Jehovah. You know, it is never in the masculine gender. This is referring to one person, clearly a person making atonement. How can they deny it? Let's keep it reading. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who will declare his generation? Verse eight. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? Wow. As he hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
and he made his grave with the wicked, verse nine, and with the rich in his death. Look at it being prophesied that the Messiah would die and be buried and be buried with the rich. Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. A wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea asked for the body of Jesus and had him put in his own mausoleum, fulfilling this verse that he would be buried with the rich in his death. Come on. Yo, you got to get excited over this. Come on. Because, verse 9, he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it has pleased the Lord to bruise him. God so loved the world, Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The father loves the son with an eternal love. The son loves the father with an eternal love, right within the triune Godhead. Yet God loves us so much that it pleased him to crush his own son. It has pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. He has put him to grief. So when you make his soul an offering for sin, so that when you, the sinner that you are, the crazy, I done things my own way, I mock Jesus, I, I didn't esteem him as nothing, so that when you, when you decide to make Jesus, look at what it says here. It says again, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief so that when you make his soul an offering for sin, when you go to the father and say, I know I'm a sinner. I know you're perfect. I know I'm far from perfect. In fact, I'm demonic. I bring a sin offering. Oh, what do I bring? Not my own good works, not my own charisma, not, you know, my philosophical jargon. I bring the death, burial, and resurrection of your son. I bring the gift you gave me, I bring as a sin offering. Boom. It says, when you do that, he, the father, will see his seed. He will prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The father looks at the son as the sufficient sacrifice. Remember, Jesus hung on the cross and said, Tetelestai, meaning paid in full. Three days later, the God, God the Father raised him from the dead. That is the amen. Jesus says, paid in full to tell us die. God the Father says, amen, by raising him from the dead. That's why it says in Romans chapter four, he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised for our justification. How do you know the blood of Jesus is enough to make a demon boy or a demon girl like you spotless? How do you know? Because God the Father raised him from the dead. The resurrection is more than just proving that Jesus is God, Romans 1. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead shows that the Father considered it a sacrifice sufficient enough for the likes of us to be saved. Romans 4, 25. He was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for our justification. Justification is a legal term, a court term. It means justified, just as if I never sinned. Yo, are you standing on that today? So that even when you're own heart tries to condemn you for being just such a knucklehead or being a forgiven Christian, but just backsliding and acting like a demon, that yo, you are justified still. There's no condemnation for them who are in Christ. Romans 8, 1. That's why it says in 1 John 2, 1, don't sin. But if anyone does sin, remember this, you have an advocate with the father. You have a defense lawyer with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Let's keep it moving. We're going to wrap this up. It says in verse 11, speaking of the continuing context of when you make Jesus the sacrifice, the when you come to the Father and say, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, I am confessing I'm a sinner, I am believing that you gave him as a sin offering for me to bring to you, and that it is a sufficient sin offering, it says that verse 11, he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Boom, what does that tell you? Way more than what Jesus endured with the physical suffering. And never mind the views on Mel Gibson and things that he's done that have been out of character. God really did use that man to make the passion of the Christ. And one thing he said very accurately is if he really showed what was really done to Jesus, as gory as the passion of the Christ was, if he really showed what was really done to Jesus, he said nobody would have been able to stand in the theater and watch it. Very true. But what this says in verse 11, God the Father will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Way worse than what Jesus went through physically was the suffering of his soul when he took the punishment of our sin in our place. People, you know, Jesus didn't go to hell after he died on the cross. Jesus experienced 
the wrath and experienced hell in his soul on the cross in a way we will never be able to wrap our minds around. He will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Satisfied in what? Satisfied that judgment has been poured out. Wrath has been poured out. The son suffered in our place. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. It says he will bear the responsibility of our iniquities. Yo, our craziness, our weirdness, Jesus took the responsibility of that. Mm. The, he paid for our sins, past, present, and future. The things we still do to this day, he took the responsibility of that. Therefore, verse 12, I will divide a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And look at this. He was numbered with the transgressors. That is the prophecy speaking of the fact that he wasn't crucified alone, but he was crucified with two rapist, murderous thieves. Look at it being prophesied all the way back here that he'd be cru not only buried in a rich man's tomb, but crucified with uh, the, the thieves. It says he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That prophecy is Jesus hanging on the cross. And what is he doing? making intercession for the very ones mocking him and esteeming him as nothing. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Isaiah 53. Yo, God bless you. Spread this word. Salute.